my wife makes fun of me all the time. And I can't help it. Like, uh, it's weird. Like, as if I would not tell the truth. Why am I telling you I would tell you the truth, right? Um, to be honest, that's another one. That's another one. I say that all the time, to be honest. Like, I'm really neurotic about telling the truth. So that's such a redundant phrase for me. I, I'm fascinated with communication, like the way that we communicate, how you can say something, but your spouse doesn't hear what you say. I mean, in your mind, it is so clear what you're saying. But in their mind, they're not hearing at all what you're saying. Has that ever happened to anyone here? Probably, if you're married, I've been in a relationship. Communication is one of the most difficult parts of an effective relationship, making sure that you're saying the same thing. Or that you're saying and speaking in a language that, that works. I've had a couple times where I've had people translate for me in different countries. And that is a very interesting experience to communicate and knowing that you're really depending on this person who you may or may not know. And they're going to have to take what you're saying and put it into a language. That happened for me in the Netherlands. And I found out that my translator was horrible. He was a student of mine from the um, university. And when I went to the Netherlands, he uh, was... Uh, his family was there, and so he was going to be my translator. But uh, from what I heard, he, he, it was pretty bad. So uh, I don't know what they think I said over there, but I'm assuming they love me. <clears throat> this happened also in, um, in, some, in some different places. And um, what you realize is that you have to have a cadence to your speaking. And you have to be selective about certain stories you say because certain things do not translate very well at all. It's so mind-blowing to me. Um, the thing about, about a message is that, is that you want that message to get across, whether it's in a song, whether it's a story, whether it's a piece of art, or whether it's just the spoken word. We're not... We're not speaking to not be heard. We're not saying things for it to just bounce off the walls. And I think we've all felt that before, even when it comes to our communication with God. Like, we want to tell Him what we think, what we feel, and we want Him to hear us. And the stereotype or the constant, like, little articulation is that it feels like when I pray, the prayers are just bouncing off the walls or off the ceiling. Maybe you've heard something like that before. But it certainly could be said that God, I'm sure, has been trying to speak to us. And that for uh, many of us, it seems to bounce off of the, the walls. We're not, we're not too keen to, to tune in sometimes to things that he's saying. How many of you are familiar with the Sistine Chapel in, uh, in Rome? Maybe you've seen some imagery of that online. I'm sure you're familiar with the um, creation, right, where you have God uh, reaching and there's Adam. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. If you've not, take a few minutes tonight and Google it. But I'm going to say, this is one of the most interesting pictures. It's fascinating. Because God, in this picture, is stretching and reaching with such tenacity and intensity. Uh, it's as if he is putting every bit of himself into the reach. But you look at Adam... And it's hilarious because his response is truly this. There's no effort, no energy. His, his unwillingness to reach back is so evident in that picture. And I think that is so telling of all of us in many forms and fashions when it comes to communicating, and especially when it comes to our faith. I want to just encourage us to take a step back and recognize God God is not waiting for us in order to reach out and bless. He's not waiting for us to gain his uh, approval, um, to earn his affection. He's not waiting for us to reach back with intensity. But it says in Scripture that he, um, we love because he first loved us. Like, he recognizes he's the first cause, the motivating factor that would, that would, kind of in us, necessitate a response. It also says in Scripture that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. It's an amazing truth that I don't think we focus on a lot. And especially if you've been raised Catholic, it's quite possible the message that you received was that God is easily irritated, that he is angry, um, that he is ready to pounce, that your sins are so devastating and terrible that he can't possibly look upon you with any type of favor and enjoyment. And many people have grown up in very strict religious experiences and homes where once they become an adult, it's very difficult for them to fall in stride in a, in a relationship with God. But, but it is all about a relationship. That's what's so interesting to me is that oftentimes we've reduced what religion is about um, to a bunch of things that we check off a list. Uh, you know, so you're here tonight. You're going to get this off your list. You're good to go. The kids are getting their training in. That's good. We're done. Then we can get back to real life. Real life where everything normal is happening. And this in so many ways can be such an inconvenience. And I get it. Believe me. I have a lot of kids and I can, I can relate. But there's something about religion that is really, uh, unfortunately, kind of misunderstood. And I think it's, it's the robbing it of its relational value. I think we've, I think we kind of set ourselves up for a failure if we look at it any other way outside of the context of a relationship. You know, Linda and I, my wife and I, we've been married for a long time. How many of you have been married for over five years? Let's just say that. How many of you have been married for over over ten years? Are there any seasoned veterans over twenty years? Wow, that's impressive because you don't even look that old. How about? Uh, over, over, over 20, 25 years? Nice. I don't even want to ask. <laughs> I feel Tomorrow's like I'm your 26th. Tomorrow's your 26th? Yeah. Praise God. What about you? <laughs> oh, that's impressive. Did you get married at like 15? <laughs> see, see what I did there? Linda and I, we've been married for, I think, over 28 years. I'm fairly confident. <laughs> She's not in approval. And I've been married to her for so long, I can sit in the same room with her and not say a word and still know I've done something wrong. <laughs> That's marriage. The thing about a good relationship to ha happen is you have to communicate. It's not, you can't business as usual. There's going to be little bumps and things that happen along the way. And 29 years, 26 years, I mean, that's not an accident. You don't accidentally stay married for 29 years. Uh, there's something intentional happening here. And when it comes to our faith, it's not an accident. And I think ultimately, though, I think it's true, though, you could stay together for long periods of time and it'd be miserable. I think that's possible. But uh, the goal is that you thrive, not survive. And I think that's similar when we talk about our faith, and specifically our faith in our family. So what's the message? Well, I'm like, I'm gonna talk, you already kind of know I'm going to talk about faith and family, but uh, I want to I have a little fun. I, I love the signs that uh, we can find on churches, the marquee, church marquees. Uh, I have such a bizarre sense of humor that um, it's quite possible uh, either Jesus laughs a lot with me or he's driven crazy. But uh, these are some signs, and this is hard to read, I know. So I'm going to read it for you. This sign says, Christmas Bazaar and Crap Show. Fight children with diabetes. Fundraiser. I just think that's so poorly written, but it's so beautiful. Fight children with diabetes. Fundraiser. I remember this one lady came up to me. She's all mad because I showed this slide. She's like, my son has diabetes and it's not funny. I'm like, my mom has diabetes. So is my sister. I'm probably going to have it soon too. All right? We already know it's horrible. The thing that's funny is that this sign, which I did not create, is wanting to fight people with diabetes. Here's another one. Eat Jessica's family. That, that just probably needs a comma or something. Or maybe rewritten. Here's one. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. United Methodist Church. Thank you. There's another similar. We love hurting people. <laughs> it's so awesome. Uh, hard to read, but I, I can't remember if I took this or not. There's a church in Pittsburgh, and I have a feeling that maybe I did, but Linda, she might be rolling her eyes now. So this is what it says. Uh, whoever stole our mower, God will get you. <laughs> That's so funny to me. 
Here's another. The class on prophecy has been canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Best option supper in St. Louis. Come and eat. Pastor Thomas Ressler. <laughs> church is like five sweet with a few nuts. Uh, let just come and get your ass in church. That's a good Catholic sign. God loves you more than Kanye loves Kanye. That seems impossible, but I kissed a girl and I liked it, then I went to hell. Okay. It's a little edgy. Free beer. Nice little Holy Baptist Church. Look, if you're a Protestant, you can name your church anything you want. And they chose to name their church Little Hope Baptist. Like, that message is hilarious to me. Christ died for our Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. Somehow I don't think that's what's supposed to be said. The thing about uh, a message is that um, it, it's, it's generally is conveying something of import. And, and when we talk about the faith, uh, our message is, is very important. This is a life-saving uh, message. And in fact, um, I think it was Eugene Peterson did a, not a translation, but probably a paraphrase of the New Testament, and it was called The Message. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing to think about God wanting to speak to us. That's an interesting idea. I wonder if it's true. And uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, it, it is. I'm going to tell you why I think it is. And you can tell me if I'm crazy later, not now. Uh, it says in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that the human person is a religious being. And I am very interested in the human person. I'm very interested in how they communicate. And I've studied this for a long time. And if you go to any type of places, I remember I was in Malaysia and I got a chance to walk through this pathway. And we went and we visited this ancient ruin where primitive cave drawings were on the wall. And, and you can find this in various cultures and places. And what's fascinating is that early cultures will memorialize the things that are important to them, like what is the meaning and purpose of that life? And usually it'll come down to fertility and proper amounts of rain for the harvest so they can take care of their family, right? And so they're conveying and they're talking about who they are in the context of what's surrounding them. How do they survive? And then they have within that this religious construct. Some of them are very primitive religions without any type of real code of ethics. Uh, it's very minimal. Maybe just don't mess around with the chief and his wife or, or live in such a way that you won't please the spirits. We lived in South Dakota as a kid, and before that, North Dakota. Lots of Native American imagery, and my mother taught at the St. Joseph's Indian School, and, and so you can learn a little bit about their culture and their way of life, and they always have um, kind of these religious constructs and a moral way of living based on their understanding of the great spirit. The interesting thing is, is that there are many cultures that have advanced, advanced civilizations that have kind of specified and modified that primitive language into very specific language. And we see that in the great religions of this world, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam or the way of life with Buddhism. The thing about it is that specific language is trying to do something. And here's what all of these religions have in common. What they're trying to do is to answer these deep primordial questions of who we are and why we're here. And what happens is that the church says that God is intentionally trying to speak a message to us. And he's so interested in us getting to know him that you can follow this, this message from the very beginning and the constant obstacles and failings of this human condition from Adam to, to, to Moses or Noah, Moses, and then you have you know David, Abraham's in there, and all of these stories and covenants. And what you begin to realize is that God is tenaciously reaching out, trying to get the attention of the human person. It's an amazing story. But even if you weren't part of that original kind of covenantal relationship like the children of Israel, you still have something inside of you that wants to know why you're here. And so look at any religion, any religion, past present or future, and they're all going to try to figure out that meaning of life, that purpose, and they're going to try to have a code of ethics, a way of living based on their understanding. Do you see? There's not. That's not bad. That's what we use to have a springboard into communicating and dialoguing with others. 
But what's so incredible is that the message that God is communicating is that no matter how far you've gone and how bad you've been, I love you and I will willingly do everything to build that bridge back into your life. It's so one-sided so often. But God is so committed to us as creation, He can't let it go. I have a tractor. It's an old Ford Amen. I can't help it. I'm, in, I'm kind of in love with it. But I'm also horrible at mechanics. And I, <laughs> I have to usually get neighbors to come over and communicate in my language like what I need to do to get her working. And um, I had an amazing experience last fall where my neighbors were over and they tweaked something and it, it chirped to life. And, uh, and it was exciting and I drove it for two seconds and then the sleep and the nastiness of the weather made me back it back up and put it in the, in the garage. And for the entire rest of the winter it waited for the, the beginning of spring to come out and to, and to enjoy my tractor. And what do you know? It wouldn't start. And not only would it not start, the things that I thought I had remedied and taken care of were no longer remedied nor taken care of. But this summer, I, like on my own, fixed it, I think, because it worked. And I drove it. And I even pulled something with it. I love that little trip. It's a bizarre relationship. I've given more to it than it has given to me. I will tell you that right now. But I am committed. And the thing about this and how ridiculous that example is, is that how much more does God look at us and desire that communion? He's so committed that even when we don't work right, even when we stumble and struggle, He is still reaching out like that picture in the Sistine Chapel. And the message it's very encouraging for you because if you if you will believe that God is for you, not against you, if you can believe that God wants to do something in you, that he hears every single one of your prayers, every moment of struggle and difficulty, he's not abandoned you, but he's been present. If you can believe that, then what's amazing is that you can share that story with your children, and that story can make a difference in their life. When I was a little kid, my parents... Uh, my parents got divorced when I was very young. I was about five. I was almost five. And I was at my grandparents' house. The coolest place on earth. Uh, is there anybody that's grandparents here? Does anybody, is anybody a grandparent by chance? I'm a grandparent. I have three grandchildren. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing. I'm going to be the best grandparent. You know there's usually cool grandparents and not cool grandparents. Do you remember that from when you were young? One set of grandparents, they knew to spoil you rotten, tell you watch TV, to eat candy sugars, but you're not cool grandma. She had the temperature at like 95 degrees, and it was hot and uncomfortable, and the toy basket was wicker, and there was a block of wood in it, and uh, it was just a desperate uh, you know, time. The thing about it is that I feel, as a grandfather, that my great joy is to just do all the things that my daughter doesn't want me to do, like feed that child quantities of sugar that no human should consume in that period of time, uh, or to basically spoil her and let her just do you know, what she wants to do, basically, with grandpa at her side. And I think, in a lot of ways, there's a special relationship between grandparents and grandchildren that I plan to perfect in the coming years. In a lot of ways, when I, when I speak about the family dynamic, it's really important to me because my parents were falling apart during this time of my life of four, almost five. My grandmother and grandfather were major, major players in my life. And from that cool grandma, I learned a, a very important principle, which was joy. You can always find joy if you look for it. Joy in what you were eating. Joy in what you were going to do. Where you were going to go. Like everything could be an event uh, to celebrate if you were with people that you loved. It was incredible to learn that from her. Not even objectively. It's not like she spoke that to me. She just modeled that for me. And my other cool, or my other grandma, not cool, not cool. She uh, was my mother's mother. And she was blind. I'm not saying that's part of her uncoolness, but I'm just simply saying maybe she, 
She would have acted differently if she could have seen because she was so persistent with trying to feed me health food, breakfast cereals that were healthy, that she ruined my childhood. The thing about it is my not cool grandma was like basically trying to probably protect me from what would inevitably be a hyperactive uh, explosion. We didn't know about Ritalin back then. There was no understanding of ADD and ADHD or, or any of those variables. There was just, my child is crazy and is burning things. Why? And uh, so my not cool grandma thought, let's stop the sugar intake. And they brought home just abusive cereal, horrible cereals, like um, grape nuts. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it has to be one of the worst cereals ever. Grape nuts probably was invented by a dentist. Grape nuts are ridiculous. <laughs> what? Yeah, but you're an adult now. So, I'm fairly sure when you were a kid, if you were given a bowl of grape nuts or frosted flakes, you would have not had the grape nuts. Right now, you're hoping that grape nuts exfoliates your, like, your... I was going to say colon, but that seems a little bit edgy, so I won't. The thing about it is, grape nuts, if you let it sit long enough in a bowl, it, it solidifies. You can turn it upside down, and nothing comes out. This is why nobody pooped in the 70s, I'm telling you right now. The other cereal, horribly abusive, was shredded wheat. Some are like, oh, I love shredded wheat. It has frosting on one side. No, it didn't. No. Original shredded wheat came in a red box. And you'd open up the red box, and there was a white feed bag. And you take the white feed bag out, and you rip it open, there's a bale of hay. And then you take the bale of hay out, you put it in the bowl, and you try to crumble it up or something, put milk in it, water, something to soften it up. Because if you don't, the shards of shredded wheat are going to cut your throat on the way down. You're going to show up to school with blood on the perimeter of your lips. I think you know what I'm saying. OK, so this was ridiculous. But this was basically my kind of dynamic with not cool grandma. But I'll tell you what she did give me that was life-changing, which was a model and a witness of someone that communicated to God constantly. <clears throat> she uh, would listen to the Bible on tape every year. Now, she couldn't read, so she would listen to the tapes, and every year she listened to the whole Bible. Then she prayed all the time, and if church was open, she always went. Joy and faith, that's what I was given by these two amazing women. And because... I respected them and loved them so much. When my mother asked me if I wanted to live for God, which I love that she did this, she didn't wait for somebody else to teach me, and she certainly wasn't going to sit back. She was going to ask me if I, as a young kid, would be interested in having a walk, a relationship with God, who wanted to walk and be in relationship with me. We're under this idea sometimes that that's Protestant lingo. And while at that time I was Protestant, I'm Catholic today. And none of that, none of that relationship with God has been jettisoned because I became Catholic. If anything, it's come into its fullness. And I think what's important for everybody here is to recognize is that, is that Jesus wants us to be in a relationship that causes us to look at life differently, look at ourselves differently, look at circumstances differently. I don't know if you've ever done this where you've sat and you've read through the Bible a little bit on your own, but uh, my wife is really good about it. I'm not as good about it, but I was the other day reading through what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember some of that? It has what's called the Beatitudes in there. And those are pretty cool. Like, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, I, wa I, I was reading through that. It's around Matthew chapter 5-ish. And uh, as I'm reading through this, I start to recognize this kind of theme that unfolds. And what the theme is, is that when you have a relationship with God, you live life differently. You look at life differently. Like the world might say, divorce is no big deal. But if you're going to follow God, there are certain things that he likes to say about it. The world might say, maybe riches, wealth, all of this kind of stuff, pursuing. It, that's what's important. But God's going to ask you to look at life a little bit differently. For example, even, even anger. Like you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye. Like in other words, you did this to me, I'll do that to you. But I say to you, if right, someone takes your... Um, come give to him your cloak. Like, it's like, what? It's completely different. 
Like when you let Jesus speak to you about who he is and who the Father is and the way that he loves, then you want to live life differently. So when I was this little kid, my parents, their marriage fell apart, had nothing to do with my, with my mother's choice. I will tell you that, and I do know that to be true. My father was moving on, let's just say, in a variety of ways, and unfortunately, she wasn't included in those variety of ways. Are you picking up what I'm throwing down? And the thing about this was, she was wrecked. Not just emotionally, but financially. By herself, trying to raise kids. And if there's any single parents here, you are my heroes. I think any single parent, as a general rule, should have to be and should be canonized because that role is beautiful and powerful. And because of my mother and her tenacity and willingness to reach back to Jesus, I, I listened to her and I chose that for myself. Like, I wanted to live for God too because she lived for God and she would have easily said, I'm broken and I'm messy and I need God. But what was awesome about the church is that not only did Jesus come to her and love her and comfort her, but the church was there for her in a way too that was beautiful. She needed that community. She needed that support. To make ends meet, she taught a nursery school in the basement of her house. How incredible. The thing about my life is that I can remember as a little boy learning the Bible verse, Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom should I fear? And because she didn't want me just to hear about God, but she wanted me to know him, she taught me that one of the ways to know God was to read the scriptures and to let it soak in you. And so as a little boy, she would sign me up to these little Bible camps. Whatever the church had to offer, I was going to be in it. Probably because she thought, maybe my kid will leave for about two weeks and be at camp and I can have a normal fun life for a little while. But, and she went and she bought antiques and basically it didn't do anything for me except for buy a wheat germ. All right, so anyway, me, to go to Bible camp, just not even a lie, as a little Protestant kid, I had to memorize the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, and probably Psalm 23. I didn't know where to go. But I'm being forced to memorize the Bible. Boy, oh boy, what a gift. In fact, that whole idea of memorizing the Bible and praying with certain verses, it changed the way I began to think about God. Because as I got older and I'm making mistakes and struggling, I, it would be easy to take what the world says and put it on myself. Like, you've made mistakes, so you're obviously not good enough. You've fallen short, so nobody will want you. Or maybe you've had this struggle, this here, this that, and then... You can start this practice of not liking yourself, but when you begin to read that God looks at you like you're the apple of his eye, that he loved us before we could ever love him, that he died on that cross because he wanted us to be free. Like, that changes a person's thinking. Begin to communicate. Do you know what's awesome? And it's a joke. I did the joke earlier. I could be in the same room with my wife and not say the you know, word and so on. No, I've done something wrong. That is true. That is a very true statement. But I will say, what's awesome about, about um, being with someone that knows you and loves you, cares about you, whether it's a great friend, whether it's a brother, a sister, a parents, grandparents, spouse, whatever, is that you don't have to explain yourself. Like, they get you. They want you to be you. Like they're not asking you to be someone else. St. Francis de Sales said, be who God made you to be, and be that perfectly well. And when you're with someone who sees you for you, I mean, that's an amazing gift. Yes, it is. Like, I don't have to explain that I would like to go and buy books at thrift stores to my wife. I mean, I love that I don't have to convince her. By the way, I have more, probably more books than most libraries in any town. Like, for real. You think I'm joking. You think it's an exaggeration, but it's not. I have probably more books than most libraries. And you know what? I don't have enough. It's called an addiction. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> I am the kind of guy that would literally buy another house just to put books in it. That is so not even a joke. I have to tell you something later about that. Sorry, but moving on. <laughs> this idea of communication is so funny now. When we were young, Everybody here is pretty old. I mean, not everybody. But we had to do this thing where we had to speak to people face to face. And if you wanted to communicate with someone, you actually uh, had to think about maybe what you were going to say. And maybe you could use a phone. That was the most modern technology we had. 
face to face or a phone. Now, did you know people break up by text or I don't even know if that by Snapchat now? Like, there's no, you don't have to do anything face to face if you don't want it anymore. This is a true story. I teach this class, um, presenting the faith in the modern world to uh, students in, on, on an online forum. And uh, what I ask them to do every, every week is a video exercise. They have to do a video interview with someone who believes differently than they do about whatever the topic is. And we were on social media, and he talked to his niece. This blew my mind. Uh, he asked her this question. Would you rather be with your best friend or a couple of your friends and have them here at the house, or would you rather uh, be with all of your friends on, online and, and kind of going back and forth on social media. And she said, I would rather communicate with everyone on social media like that. I don't even, I don't even know what to do with that. I thought, that can't be real. That cannot be real. But it's real. And maybe just because you can control your own environment and circumstances, and maybe you're less likely to, you know, whatever, make a mistake, everything's intentional. But it just blows my mind. I hate texting. My fingers screw up every text. This is a true story. I one time texted someone who was a religious person down in like Louisiana. It was a lady who was like in charge of a, a diocese. And I just said something like, I was gonna say, how are things? Like just reaching out. But I texted, how's your thong? And it went. <laughs> Thank God she has an awesome sense of humor. And, and it was pretty awesome. Uh, after I got out of jail, uh, <laughs> just, just kidding. The thing about the thing about relationships and communications is that um, when I was a kid, not only did my mother teach me about about Jesus and encourage me to read the scriptures, and not only did she take me to church every time the church was open, but but she also she also lived it in a way that made it appealing to me. Like she invited us into her circumstance. So again, because we struggled financially, and I never would have known this really, uh, there's a memory I have of us as kid, uh, kids, my sister and I, uh, we were with my mom in some ghetto vehicle, and uh, we were running out of gas. And the reason I know we were running out of gas is that my mother said something like this, we're running out of gas, and uh, we have no gas, and we are like 20 miles away from the gas station. And this is in North Dakota, uh, where there's you know, barely any visible signs of life. And so uh, she knows if we can get to this city, then we can get gas. But the possibility is not looking good. Here she is, single mom, two kids, middle of the freaking nowhere, North Dakota. And um, she said, we let's pray. And so we prayed. And every time the odometer went to another mile, we cheered. We were so elated that God let us get one more mile. And this is not even like we, the last fume of gas gave out as we rolled in to the gas station. I mean, that's an amazing lesson to learn as 